On this episode, I'm going to be seeing if I can hook up a third floppy drive to this IBM 5150 PC. Why would I want to do that? Find out right now on the Retro Hack Shack. Now, this isn't the first bit of restoration that I've had to do to this 5150. Here's what it looked like when I took it apart after buying it. It was in great shape mechanically, but it was really filthy. I cleaned out the power supply. Here's what it looked like when I got it. I don't think it had ever been cleaned. I didn't take an after photo, but this thing is spotless now. You'll just have to take my word for it. And I added a new fan, uh, maybe overkill, but it is a lot quieter now. It's running now. Um, and uh, since I'm on my lav mic, you, can, you probably can't even hear it at all. I removed the 20 megabyte MFM hard drive that was in here. I was able to make a backup of the data, but the drive was very loud and seemed like it was on its last legs. I might work on it later to see if I can refurbish it. In its place, I added an XT to CF card so I can easily add programs with a removable compact flash card. I also 3D printed a blank plate that looks like a hard drive, and I connected an LED to it to complete the illusion. I had to fix a bad memory chip on the RAM expansion board. This AST 6-pack plus board also has a real-time clock, parallel port, COM port, and joystick port, which is pretty cool. And I'm not done yet. I still need to paint the case to cover up some dings and scratches, and I have a few labels to reattach. If you want to see a video with tips about how to do those things, leave a comment below. But today, I want to see if I can add at least one external floppy drive. A few weeks ago, I happened to go down to one of the places that I look for retro computing, vintage computers and things like that. And I happened to find these Byte magazines down there. And I think it actually illustrates the point really well for why you would want to hook up a third floppy drive. Why not just put a hard drive in, for example? And so I want to take a look at some of these ads. I was just looking through here. It was amazing. Um, it just happened to be the first magazine I picked up. This was in 1980. So this was about a year before the IBM 5150 PC, the IBM PC was released into the market. And so I think by taking a look at this magazine, we can kind of take a, have an idea for why you might have wanted more than two floppy drives. But because this is a little hard to read, let's switch over to the computer and I can show you some close up of some of these ads and things in this Byte magazine. So here's that same Byte magazine I was just showing on camera, uh, only this is the digital version. If you ever want to take a look at some of these old magazines from a historic, especially from a historical perspective, you can go to archive.org and look up Byte magazine or just do a Google search for Byte magazine archive. First link should be archive.org where you can find back issues for a lot of these magazines, not just Byte magazine, but PC magazine, popular computing, um, you know, any of these magazines that you might want to look at from a historical perspective should be here, uh, which is great. It's a great resource to look for, you know, how much did this thing cost when it first came out? Or uh, what were people saying? What were the reviews of this particular computer or component when it first came to market? I, I find it fascinating. Anyway, um, in this magazine here, you can see uh, there's the, the trifecta here of the three computers that were released around 1977 to the public, those being the Commodore PET, the Apple II, and the Tandy slash Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 1. So you can see that they're listed here, and this particular ad is for a printer, I believe, that works with all three of them, uh, which is great. But here's where this relates to why we want to add a third um, or why there was even an option to add a third and a fourth floppy drive to your computer. Uh, none of these machines came with the hard drive built in. And although there were hard drive options added for them later on, they were really expensive. And so unless you had a lot of money to shell out for a five or 15 megabyte hard drive, <laughs> believe it or not, those were the capacities that were available. Uh, you probably did not I have the money to do that, and, and they really weren't available. The main storage capacity for these were either floppy drives or tape drives, which was really cool that the PET had the tape drive built right in. Um, the TRS-80, it was quite common to see those with at least two floppy drives coming off the side, but they had the option for four. 
Um, I believe the Apple II could support four as well, although you commonly saw those with two. And then the PET as well, I think, had option for multiple floppy drives because that was the primary means for storage. Just to illustrate how expensive these things were, um, you can see this is the, the Byte magazine I showed just a minute ago. Right inside the first page, here are some advertisements for um, hard drive storage. And you can see that this particular hard drive here from SWT, uh, SWTPC um, took up a whole cabinet. Look at that. Um, the, you know, they had the nice wood grain here, which is great, but this took up a whole cabinet of space. This was actually for one of the early systems that was out uh, based on the 6809 processor. But, um, you know, look at how expensive this thing was, right? I mean, this was a 16 megabyte hard drive for $4,000 and the matching desk was only $150. <laughs> so you can see how expensive this was. Uh, likewise, here's a, um, uh, on the other page here, here's another hard drive um, uh, advertised, you know, uh, 11 megabyte hard drive basically, right? Um, and this, I believe this was for an S100 compatible type system. So this was something um, similar to, if you're familiar with the Altair 8800, for example, there was a whole range of machines that were Altair um, bus compatible, so to speak. So they took that bus that was in the Altair and it really kind of led to the, for a short while, for this whole S100 series of computers um, where you could just slide whole cards into that bus. So you could have a card for a Z80, you could have a card for an 8088, um, and I think even 8086 and so on and so on, a 6502 card. So you could kind of run various CPU uh, microprocessor architectures on the same, in the same cabinet, not at the same time necessarily, but you know, you could swap out cards and, oh, now I'm running a 6502 and let me do some assembly on that. And you can hear, you can see here, here's a, a kit S100 bus. Uh, this looks like a memory card. There's an EEPROM card, um, all sorts of things that you can find. Here's that Z80 card I was talking about, or one of them, right? So people were making these cards and selling them to hobbyists who were building, essentially building their own uh, computers, maybe with different architectures that they could swap in and out. When you think about it, it's actually pretty interesting. Anyway, back to the point at hand. The hard drives themselves were very expensive. So you, it wasn't likely that you were going to buy a hard drive for one of these systems. You were just going to use floppy drives. So you can imagine that in floppy one, you might have your operating system. In floppy two, you may have the program that you're running. But then when you want to store something uh, long term, uh, maybe a copy of your document you were working on or a spreadsheet, you would have to save that somewhere else. Or maybe you had room on your program disk. Maybe you didn't. Typical disks at this point were 180K. I think 360K were coming out. So you didn't have a lot of storage space, even with floppies. And unless you wanted to invest a lot of money in a hard drive, which most people didn't at this point, then a third or even a fourth floppy drive were actually quite common for people that were doing a lot of work on their systems and needed a lot of storage space. They needed to save the programs they were working on on a third or fourth floppy disk. If you want more information about uh, the history of why there's four drives in PCs or the difficulties about adding four drives to a PC or even more than four drives, I'd really recommend this video from Tech Tangent, where he goes into a little bit more on the history and how to get started, what you might look for if you're rebuilding, let's say, a 486 style uh, uh, PC or something of that vintage, and you want to have four drives in it. Um, he goes into great detail, so highly recommend it. And I'll link to that up above. So that was the early 80s. And thanks to this Byte magazine, we can take a look at why someone uh, may not have had enough funds to buy a hard drive for those early systems. Um, however, there's another reason in today's world why you might want to add a third floppy drive. When I restore a system, I basically like to keep it somewhat authentic. Now, I did 3D print the uh, front panel for that drive, but I tried to do it in period style, so it looked like a drive was inside. You may have also noticed that there's two floppy drives in that 5150 as well. Very common for the day to have that, so I left those there, and that's uh, great for getting that physical, tactile um, feel of putting a disk in a drive, closing the door, loading a program. Um, all of that is great. 
However, there is an issue. Not only do I have the CF card that I can load programs on, but I also want to be able to put in a floppy drive image um, using a GoTech. GoTechs are very popular. I have one here. Uh, GoTechs are very popular for uh, emulating floppy drives. And you can connect these up to, you know, IBM, Amiga, Commodore 64. Well, maybe not the Commodore 64, actually, now that I think about it. Uh, but certainly the Amiga, the Atari ST, uh, you can use these with, and then you can bring in files off of a USB stick, um, put those in your GoTech drive, connect this to your system, and then it treats it as an actual floppy drive. Uh, and you can switch back and forth between the images on your USB stick very easily without. So if you don't even have a floppy drive or maybe your floppy drive's not working, you just want to get a system booted, you can use one of these GoTech drives to do that with. Now on this GoTech drive, I'm using the Flash floppy um, um, firmware for this particular drive. I found Flash floppy to be excellent. I've been able to do almost everything I need to do with Flash floppy. There is other versions of firmware that you can put on one of these uh, GoTech drives, but I prefer Flash Floppy. So that's what I'm running. And I'll put a link to the uh, GitHub page for Flash Floppy down below in the description if you want to try this out. Um, but I want to be able to connect this externally without necessarily modifying the front of the case to look any different. I want the case to look as authentic as possible, but still give me the flexibility to attach a GoTech to bring in floppy drive images or other things that I want to do with the machine. So what we're going to do today is actually make a cable so that we can connect the back of that floppy drive controller with, with a 37 pin uh, D sub connector, which is what I have right here. I bought some of these online and I also bought one of these universal floppy cables. These universal floppy cables can connect to either the 34 pin um, uh, pin style um, floppy drives like that one, like the uh, uh, floppy drive I showed in the intro to the video, or it will also connect to the card edge type floppy drives. And those were typically found in the 180, uh, 360, 720, and 1.2, uh, um, up to 1.2 megabyte versions of the five and a quarter inch drive. So if you have a five and a quarter inch drive, more than likely it's got one of these card edge connectors on it. If you've got one of the smaller three and a half inch drives, uh, probably it has the pin style connector on it. So let's see if we can figure out a way to connect this 37 pin D sub connector that was on the IBM 5150 uh, floppy drive controller external to this 34 pin universal floppy drive connector. Now, before we can actually get into building this, uh, essentially an adapter from 37 pin to 34 pin, uh, we need to do a little research. So I wanted to show you this website. If you're working on an early IBM PC, whether it's a 5150, 5160, 5170, and so forth, this is the absolute best site to go to for information. Um, this site is called minus zero degrees.net, and it's got all kinds of good information with links to another great resource, which is the Vintage Computer Forums. That's the VCFED Forums. And you can go here and find all sorts of information, not just about uh, IBM, early IBM PCs, but pretty much any vintage machine that you want to. You can see here there's discussions about Tandy, discussions about Commodore, although not as many as you find on other forums. I find most of the information here is, um, or the best information you're going to find here is on the, uh, is, is about IBM. And even you can see here, even the S100 series computers. There's a forum for that as well. So pretty cool. So now I'm back here at the uh, X minus, I always want to call it X minus one. What is it? X minus zero degrees, minus zero degrees. That's what it is. Minus zero degrees dot net. Um, I don't know why. I guess because I'm a fan of X minus one old time radio shows. Minus three, minus two, X minus one. Fire. Um, I, I kind of want to keep it. I want to call it X minus one. But this is minus one degrees dot net. We're back on that page now. And if we click on floppy drive support, you can see there's a number of, it gives you all the information about what kind of drives you can run um, on that. And there's some information down here about running a 720K disk in a 1.44 megabyte drive, which it should read. So maybe we can test that later. Um, but right now, what we want to do is we want to, um, connect an external cable to one of these drives. 
So down here, there's also a link to for external connections see here. And when we go there, there's some explanation about how this works, what some of the restrictions are, some information about jumper settings, uh, because in these PCs, there are jumper settings on the board that you have to um, switch in order to get this to work. Um, but what we're interested in is how to make a cable. And right here we see step one, construct the data cable. And there's some images here that we want to use to do this. So you can see here, um, this is this is how it hopefully will look in the end with the 37-pin uh, connector on one end, 34-pin connector on the other. And you need to be able to line up these pins just so, so that um, the pinout matches. So here's a great image that someone made that illustrates the connectivity between the two connector types. So you can see on the D, on the uh, 30, uh, 37 D sub, it's one through, the pins are one through 19 at the top and then 20 through 37 at the bottom. <clears throat> and what we need to do is we need to connect pin six through 18. So almost to the end, actually, of that top row. So these pins right here, six through 18, need to be connected to eight through 32, um, all of the even pins. And I believe the connections on the 34 pin, these are gonna be all essentially in the same row. So what that means is we should be able to cut off the end of the connector. And then if we're careful, if we start at pin six, we should be able to connect all of these uh, pins um, without actually having to move the cable that much or move pins around. They should all just line up. At least that's the plan. So keeping this, I'm going to print out this um, uh, diagram here just to make sure. And I'm also going to include a pin out on the 34 pin just to make sure that the pin numbers match. I'm going to have that as a reference. So now we can move over to the bench and see if we can actually make that cable. Okay, so I'm back over at the bench and we're finally ready after taking a look at all that history. Um, whoop, spare jumper wire there for breadboard. Uh, keep that for later. Is Actually, this is a 40-pin connector. All right, hold up. I'm going to get the 34-pin connector. Okay, so I'm back with the right um, pinout now, the right picture in my diagram, um, and Starbucks coffee, uh, which is nice. Uh, my kids brought me that. Thank you, kids. So, um, so it's really important actually that you get to build these diagrams. At least I find it is. I find it incredibly useful to build these diagrams and use them. In fact, uh, that would make a good tech tip. Maybe I'll insert a little tech tip here about that. Say, gang, are you frustrated with trying to remember pinouts and colors when making custom cables for your vintage computer or game system? Here's a tip. Make a diagram. Diagrams help you match out what pins to connect, saving you time and cutting down on the frustration. Make a diagram and spend more time enjoying your systems and less time cursing at them. Anyway, enough of that silliness. Okay, so um, we've got the diagram, we've got the right pinout, and what we're looking at, again, is the, um, the pinout of the 37-pin D-shell which is one through 19 straight across, but you'll notice on the 34 pin connector, um, it goes back and forth. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to 33, 34. So uh, I've taken apart these back in the day, I took one apart or one was falling apart. Um, and so I took it apart to see how it worked. I'm gonna take a look at that again, just to make sure that these will line up correctly. Cause what I wanna do is I want to cut off, um, probably this part of the cable up here, and then connect one of the, the 37 pin connectors right to that. And then I can connect, um, you know, either type of floppy drive here and either type of floppy drive here. But, um, you know, I gotta match this up because this red pin, red wire here is wire one, should go to position one. And then the question is, how do these line up? These are straight across, I assume one through 34, probably shouldn't use that sharp knife. Um, let's use a paintbrush instead. There we go. So I assume these are one through 34 this way, but obviously, you know, when you look at it this way, they're one, two, three, four, and so on. So I wanna take this apart and just see how it, 
how it maps out. And we'll do that by using a multimeter in, in, in uh, continuity mode and see how these pins map to the physical wires to make sure that we're getting these wires correct. There's a little bracket, there's a little uh, notch there. And I think if I take a screwdriver, I think if I take a screwdriver, I can just pry this apart and take this off if I remember correctly. I haven't done this in forever. Might need a smaller screwdriver. I certainly don't want to uh, jam up my fingers. Look like Adrian Black with all of his band-aids. So you can see how the pins are um, alternating. Pin one and pin two, for example, well, this would be pin one and pin two, are alternating so that they make contact. And these um, metal pins here essentially go through the cable to make contact with each one of these wires as you go from one to 34. Now contrast that with one of these big 37 pin D subs. You can see they are quite different in the way that they connect. They both take ribbon cables, but this one, the pins are much closer in spacing. And this one, uh, the pins, you know, one row of pins is way over here. The other row of pins is way over there. It would still work if I overlay this cable on top of here like this and press down. Uh, if I lined it all up cor correctly, you know, essentially the same ribbon cable would work for either, but the, but the, um, the layout is different. So we're going to have to make sure that we map out pin one, or sorry, pin one uh, on this to probably pin one on this one. And it might mean that we have to separate these cables to get them to line up exactly. Um, but I'm not sure. So let's take a look and see. So I've got my meter in continuity mode um, here so I can test out these pins just to make sure I understand what's going on and how this thing is connected before I transfer it over to here. It's kind of obvious at this point. I'm just gonna double check anyway. Maybe it is to you. I'm just gonna double check. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna insert this uh, pin header in here so that I can test this a little bit more easily just to validate uh, what we're seeing. Okay, that should be making, should be making good contact now. So this pin, according to the diagram, should be two. And I just wanna make sure that that matches up to the second pin in the ribbon, which is connected over here to this one. And, yep, oh, just wasn't making good contact there. So pin two is definitely mapping out. And pin the next one on this row down here should be pin four. Yep, and it is. So definitely um, the second, I've confirmed that the second, it goes one, two, Three. And this number two maps out to this pin. Number four maps out to this pin. Six, eight, just like you would expect. Uh, let me see if I can put a mark on that with a Sharpie so that I know. That is pin eight on the floppy. So now I know that needs to go at pin six. It does match exactly with pin six. So actually what I think I can do is I can use these old holes as a guide maybe. It looks like they do fit exactly over these old holes. I'm gonna double check just to make sure I've got continuity. And I'm gonna press this down with the screwdriver just to make sure I've got these wires in there. But basically, because of the way this is laid out, I think it's just as easy as that. But now with that basically connected, uh, I'm gonna leave it like that, and then I'm gonna test to see if I have continuity. Ah. There we go. I'm gonna to test to see if I have continuity with the right pins on the IDE connector, or on the uh, floppy connector. So let me get my pin header back out so I can test this more easily. Okay, so I finished toning all these out. They tone out fine. And uh, according to the diagram, that should be all I need to be able to make this floppy connection work. So right now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put these two pieces, these caps essentially on the top of this connector to keep it from coming out. 
Okay, that should keep it nice and tight. And then if you want, you can fold that over like that. And this will keep it a little bit more secure so that you can't, when you're pulling up on it like this, if you ever had to pull up on it like this, it wouldn't be pulling directly on those pins. So that's why they made these caps. Same thing with this old uh, um, 34 pin connector we're not using anymore. It's two pieces. One holds down the wire and then you wrap the cable over it and then the other piece goes on top like that. And that keeps it from pulling out quite so easily. All right, so this is done. Uh, I think there's nothing else to do but to test it. Let's go back to the bing bong table and give it a test. And one more note before we actually test this thing out. I forgot to mention this. The uh, GoTech, you might be wondering, for those of you who are familiar with floppy drives, they need to be powered. And normally this is uh, inside. There's a power connector inside the PC. A uh, small one like this coming out of the power supply or on the old 51, uh, sorry, uh, uh, five and a quarter inch drives, there was a, a bigger uh, standard size Molex connector. Um, so you do need to power these drives externally somehow. And what I've done is I've simply cut off a um, floppy power connector and connected it to one of these USB breakouts um, that breaks out, in this case, uh, ground uh, five volts and then data, but I don't have those connected, data one and data two. So basically I'm powering this floppy drive or any other floppy drive that has this connector type over USB. The nice thing is I can plug this in with a battery um, like this one. Um, this little, one of these little battery banks, you can power this externally as well. And so it makes for a really easy way to power these externally. You could build a whole case. You could 3D print something, put your floppy drive in it, uh, figure out another way to power it, either with the computer power supply or externally. This is just a really easy way to do it because USB is pretty ubiquitous. This is going to supply more than enough amperage to power a GoTech or a regular floppy drive. And, you know, I should be able to actually, I keep talking about adding a third drive. I should be able to also with this cable add a fourth drive because it has two floppy connectors. So we could test also having a GoTech and a um, high density 1.44 meg floppy connected um, together at the same time and actually get four drives working. So maybe I'll do that too. All right, let's go test it out. All right, so it's time to test this out. Um, I'm going to turn on the, uh, I've got the uh, new cable plugged in, I've got the GoTech attached, and I'm going to go ahead and turn on the uh, 5150. Now, before I do, just keep in mind, if you've never uh, run a 5150, or if you're thinking about getting a 5150 and you turn it on and nothing happens for a while, just wait. <laughs> it takes a long time. I think last time I, t I timed it, it was like 50 to 60 seconds for the 5150 to actually boot up to uh, working prompt because it goes through some self-test. Every time you boot it up, it does some self-test, figures out where things are at, takes a while. So actually, I'm going to go ahead and turn this on and let's start a counter and we'll see how long it takes to actually get to, uh, to, actually get to the prompt. And while we're waiting, what we should see is when the uh, computer boots up, uh, we probably won't see the drive right away because I think I need to add some files or add some lines to the config.sys file so that it'll actually see this extra drive. But let's just see uh, what happens when we boot up. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Okay, there we go. And it's still booting up. This is the BIOS for the Compact Flash card. Okay, so we're finally at a C prompt. Um, now, like I said, I put in these lines earlier, so let's go ahead and edit the config.sys file. Here's the config.sys, and these are the two lines actually that I need to have in here. I put these in before. I just need to, I had them commented out and I need to remove that little rem statement. And I'm hoping that I can get two drives working. So I put in one drive. Uh, you can see here, this is device two. So the two internal floppy drives are, are device one, zero and one. The two external floppy drives, this card sees as device two and three. So this should be device two. I currently have a 360K 
uh, drive image in here. So that would be 40 tracks and nine sectors. And um, this is a 1.44 megabyte drive. That's going to be seen as drive three. So that I need to make that 80 tracks, nine sectors. And then this tells it to read it as a 720K drive. So let's save this and reboot. Okay, looking good so far. Notice that when you do Control Alt Delete, it doesn't go through all of that boot sequence that I mentioned before. It's just when you would do a cold boot that it does all that diagnostic stuff. Okay, so this is good. So now we're seeing loaded external disk driver for drive E and loaded external disk driver for drive F. It assigned E and F because the two floppy drives I have are A and B. And then um, I've got two hard disk partitions on the compact flash drive. Those are C and D. And so the next two logical letters, I don't mean logical as in logical drives, now I'm just saying logic as in logic, uh, after D would be E and F. So those should be here. So let's see what happens when we go to E and hopefully we're able to access this GoTek drive. Oh, that's not good. That should come up, you know, almost immediately. That's weird. Okay, let's try, let's retry a couple of times. Maybe there's just something Something wrong with the connector. I am a little worried about those pins. Retry again. Nothing. Abort that operation. Okay, well, this isn't good. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and fail. Put in C colon to go back to C. I'm going to go back and check those connections one more time just to make sure that all the ground connections and everything is uh, uh, tracing out the way it should. Okay, so I'm back at the bench. I've taken a look at this cable and everything pins out okay, but I did notice over here on the diagram something interesting. So the way that I've been connecting this is to only one side of the pins on the connector and not the other side. However, if you look here, there's a note uh, on the, on the paper here. And it says ground pins 20 to 37 not shown, but they still need to be connected all the way through to both of these connectors here. And so I think that is the problem. The fact that I don't have any ground because the way that I'm, uh, connecting this is from that one side only that doesn't have any ground on it. So if we open this up, I'll show you what I mean. Okay, see that? I was connecting everything on this side only, but these are the ground pins on this side. So basically there was no ground and that's why it wasn't working. So I'm gonna take this off, flip it around so that both all of the even, or the uh, one through 19 are connected here and 20 through 37 are connected. And that will supply ground through to uh, the rest of this connector and the drive should work. So let's try that out. So I had to use quite a bit of force to get the the cable to go on the pins on the back side of this connector, which bent the shielding a little bit. So I'm just straightening it out. All the pins look okay though. So I guess I remember this back in the day, having this be so hard to connect. I'm just going to Tone this out real quick, make sure everything's connected, including the ground pins, before I put it back on the 5150. All right, so I'm back again. Uh, I have um, thoroughly tested that cable again. Everything's connected now. Uh, and I've got both drives connected here. So I've got the, the real drive, I guess. Uh, this is the 1.44 megabyte drive, but it has a 720 kilobyte formatted disk in there. So this is not a 1.44 megabyte drive. Actually it is. It's a uh, 1.44 megabyte drive with the hole taped off, which makes it 720. Once you format it with that hole taped off, it, it recognizes it as 720 um, meg drive. Okay, so I've got the 720 meg drive in there, and then I've got a 360 
uh, sorry, 720K drive in there and a 360K disk image mounted on the GoTech. So if everything worked okay, we should be able to go to E and see the GoTech and go to F and see the real floppy drive. So go to E. Oh, that's much better. And DIR. And great. So we can definitely see files on here. Um, CM, I believe, is Chessmaster 2000. So we'll take a look at that in just a minute. And then let's go to F, see if that's working. It looks like it is. Ah, perfect. Arkanoid. So I wasn't sure what was on that disk, but I knew it was 720K. And as you can see here, if you look at the, um, you know, add up how many bytes are used and how many bytes are free, that adds up to about 720K there. And then this one up here, I think, is uh, adds up to about 360K. So there we go. They're both working. That's awesome. So now uh, I can button this up once the case is painted, button this up, put the case on, and then if I still want to load either a 720K drive with the real floppy drive or uh, 360, 180, 720K um, disk image with the GoTech, I can do that externally, and I don't have to worry about taking everything apart or ruining the... Uh, um, uh, the magic, so to speak, of the 5150 when it looks normal, basically, when it looks like it did back in the 80s. So this is awesome. Let's just check this out, make sure that, um, let's go to E first and make sure that things are working. Let's see, CM. Definitely some activity happening there. So far, so good. Welcome to Chessmaster 2000. They even got some of the formatting. This is the logo that's on the disc um, uh, and the box and everything. That's really cool. So it looks like there's some, yeah, this is working. Um. <laughs> I always remember everybody had this. This seemed to be like the gold standard for chess games. Um. Let's see if Chessmaster will detect the uh, four move win here. I'm sure it will. Oh, it already has actually, because it moved that there. So yeah, sometimes you can get, if, if they move their pawns up here, you can get this over there. And if you do that, um, uh, you can do a four move checkmate, but yeah, Chessmaster's too, too good for that. Okay, let's try the other disc and make, just make sure it's working. All right, let's go to the F drive. And this has Arkanoid on it. And let's just see if it works. Nope. Um, I could try different floppies. I'm really not worried about it at this point. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I'll be able to at least read from this, if not write to it. And will I ever actually need to use this? Really, the whole point of this was to use the GoTech. And the GoTech seems to be working fine. We even ran a program from there. So um, I think that's really all I'm after. I can always put a 720K disk image in here too um, and, and switch to it. So I'm really, really not that worried about it. The whole goal of this was to be able to use the GoTech. I can do that now, so I'm pretty happy. All right, so that's gonna wrap it up for this edition of Retro Hack Shack. Thanks for watching. Um, I guess the lesson learned here today was be sure to read your documentation. Uh, take my tip as I did not do and create your, your, especially when you're making cables, be sure to write everything down, color match everything, figure out where your wires are going. Uh, make sure you don't get your wires crossed, so to speak. Um, and that'll really help avoid some of these issues that we had here today. So thanks again for watching. Uh, please like and subscribe as my channel is brand new and just getting going. It'll really help a lot. So share this with your friends if you like it or if you think they'll like it. I would really appreciate it and we'll see you next time.